You're listening to Book Insights, brought to you by Memoed, finding and simplifying the world's most powerful ideas to fit into your lifestyle. Each episode is a deep dive into a nonfiction bestseller that can change your life or make you think. In around 30 minutes, you'll learn all about a book that offers wisdom for your life, career, or business. So get ready to live and work smarter, better, and happier with Book Insights. In September 1963, Catherine Graham became president of the Washington Post Company. Her husband, Phil Graham, power player and publisher of the Washington Post, had committed suicide in August, leaving the Post unmanned and in uncertain hands. A day before the funeral, Catherine, who had always been terrified of public speaking, went before the Washington Post board, shell-shocked. She assured them that the paper would not be sold and would continue into the next generation. It had been her father's paper, her mother had written for it, and Catherine was no stranger to its inner workings. It was dawning on her that the only way to hold on to the company, to keep it in the family, would be taking on the job herself. Personal History is Catherine Graham's autobiography, it follows the story of Catherine's life from daughter of a rich New York financier to busy mother to her sudden elevation into the highest echelons of American business. The book traces her efforts to fill a role she never expected to be given. It's also an insider's look into many of the great 20th century political events, such as the Watergate scandal, the Pentagon Papers, and the role Graham and the Washington Post played in exposing them. Personal history is partly the story of the rebuilding of the Post, but it's also a leadership book. Graham never intended or wanted to lead, but she became one of the most powerful media figures in America. For many years, she was the only woman running a Fortune 500 company. She became an unlikely beacon for female equality and empowerment. Her story tells us that not only are there no born leaders, but that all of us can be transformed by situations thrust upon us. We'll follow the key events and lessons from Graham's life in chronological order, starting with her family background, then discussing her marriage and her husband's mental illness. We'll go into how she dealt with becoming a corporate leader, her role in Watergate and the Pentagon Papers, and the nuts and bolts of running a newspaper empire. The book Insight will finish with some reflections on Graham's legacy as a leader and will update you on where the Washington Post is today, including the role that Amazon CEO Jeff Bezos is playing in its future. Catherine Meyer was born in 1917. Her father, Eugene, was Jewish and a Yale-educated financier who would become a governor of the New York Stock Exchange. He was also chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank. Meyer was a successful investor in chemicals, and by 1931, his stock in the Allied Chemical Company was worth over $40 million. Catherine's mother, Agnes, was a society beauty who would later become a well-known journalist. Catherine and her siblings grew up in the family's grand Washington home, which she remembers was filled with Manets, Renoirs, and Brancusi sculptures. In 1933, Eugene Meyer bought the Washington Post, a struggling newspaper with only the fifth biggest circulation in the city. It became a money pit for Meyer, but he threw himself into being a newspaper man and cared deeply about the new enterprise. The paper became a big part of Catherine's life from her mid-teens onward. Eventually, she worked at the Post full-time between graduating high school and starting college. Like her parents, she began to feel strong loyalty to the Post and its ethos of truth and impartiality. The idea of working in journalism became a possibility, even though there were hardly any female journalists at the time. Her mother was writing stories for the Post and interviewing major figures such as Thomas Mann and Sigmund Freud. Agnes offered a tip to her daughter. Be a newspaper woman, Kay, if only for the excuse it gives you to seek out at once the object of any sudden passion. At 20, Catherine went to work as a journalist for the San Francisco News. She loved it, 
She was dating a waterfront labor organizer and spending time at Yosemite National Park with photographer Ansel Adams and his wife. After a year or so, she returned to Washington to work on the editorial page of the Washington Post. Here's Graham herself being interviewed for C-SPAN's book notes. In 1939, when I, my father came out and suggested that I come back from San Francisco and work on the Post, and, and I was, it was time for me to leave there in many ways, and I was happy to do that. What was your job? It was low person on the editorial page. Um, I edited letters to the editor, I made up the page, and I wrote a few editorials of no great moment. Washington was an exciting place to be during the Roosevelt administration of the 1930s, full of bright young people attracted to FDR's New Deal programs. As part of her social world, she met Phil Graham. From an undistinguished background, he had made it to Harvard Law School, becoming editor of its law review. Here's Graham on book notes once again. And then about New Year's, my sister gave a party and invited everybody at the house where they were then living. And there were 12 of them. And he was in the party, and we first got to know each other that way. And uh, this developed rather quickly because the third time we went out together, he discussed marriage. Catherine and Phil got married. Then Phil began working for the Washington Post. He was soon put in charge of the paper by Eugene Meyer, who had become head of the World Bank. Meyer gave his shares in the Washington Post Company to Phil and Catherine. Overnight, Catherine recalls, the couple became adults with a huge but exciting responsibility. Eugene Meyer had always said that a newspaper must be a successful commercial enterprise in order to survive, but has obligations which transcend any commercial interest. Phil Graham strengthened this ethos leading campaigns against racial segregation and organized crime in Washington, D.C. But the Washington Post at this time was far from the dominant paper in Washington, let alone the nation. There was stiff competition, and it struggled to grow its audience. It was only in 1954, after years of trying, that the Grams finally got the opportunity to acquire the Washington Post's bigger rival, the Times-Herald. And with that, it doubled the company's circulation instantaneously. Phil Graham poured more effort into making the Post a bastion of independence, which brought political costs. For example, when the Post attacked the methods of Senator Joe McCarthy's House Committee on Un-American Activities, it was vilified by the right and other newspapers for being a defender of communists. As the 1960s began, the Grams were at the center of Washington's political and media elite. They were friends of John and Jackie Kennedy and knew many members of the Kennedy administration. Phil would write speeches for Bobby Kennedy and had easy access to JFK. After Kennedy was elected president, he asked Phil to head ComSat, a public-private enterprise at the forefront of satellite communication. Catherine felt that her husband had too much on his plate already, but he accepted. The pages where Catherine describes the early days of the Cuban Missile Crisis are fascinating. She and Phil, because of their closeness to the Kennedys, knew what was going on before it broke in the press. In fact, the Post was the first to tip off the world as to what was happening. Another coup at the time was when Phil negotiated for the Post to buy an up-and-coming New York-based current affairs magazine called Newsweek. So Catherine and Phil seemed to be on top of the world. What went wrong? Despite all these outward successes, Catherine knew that her husband was struggling. In 1957, he had had a nervous breakdown after working to exhaustion. Only in hindsight did she realize it was part of a pattern of manic depression. There were swings from hyperactivity, impatience, and explosive anger to calmness and deep insecurity in shorter and shorter cycles. Phil also began manically acquiring things like a second family farm, an art magazine, and even a Gulfstream private plane. Then, Catherine discovered her husband's affair with Robin Webb, an Australian journalist working for Newsweek. The bottom fell out of her world. Their lives were so bound up together in every way, emotionally, socially, and materially, she just couldn't conceive of them being apart. Phil gave a speech at a newspaper event and started insulting and cursing the audience before trying to take off his clothes. 
He was escorted from the stage and flown to a mental hospital. After much time and treatment, Phil returned to a semi-normal life, but he resumed his affair and stated his intention to divorce Catherine. Catherine faced a situation in which her estranged husband had control of the Post voting shares with 51% of the stock. She believed the Post would not even exist without her father's money or her own contributions and prepared herself for a fight. Having lived in Phil's shadow for decades, she then discovered the steel inside. To Catherine's utter relief, Phil came back to her. She tried to make things normal again, but Phil was now in a new cycle of depression. He managed to convince doctors that treatment was going well and that a few days with Catherine at the family's farm, Glenn Welby, would do him good. It was at Glenn Welby, while Catherine was in another room, that Phil Graham shot himself with one of the farm guns. In the years ahead, she would constantly relive the scene of finding his body. Here's Graham on book notes. He came back to us, but he was so ill and so depressed, and I had seen him through two of these depressions, and I just felt unequal to doing it again. And he was asked to and voluntarily did go to a hospital from which he succeeded in getting a day off during which he killed himself. Black with grief, uninterested in remarrying, she felt she was taking a veil, meaning she was now married to the company. Let's take a break. When we return to personal history, we'll learn about Catherine Graham's entry into the corporate arena. We'll see Graham gain her stride only to land in the middle of the biggest political debacle of the 20th century, Watergate. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. When Catherine Graham took on the role of publisher at the Washington Post, she had expected things to continue much as they were under the guidance of a team of top executives. She was not prepared for the array of big and small decisions being thrown her way every minute of every day. She had been party, first to her father, then to Phil's conversations about the business for years. But she says the difference between this and actually running the company is the difference between watching people swim and actually swimming. She didn't know how the company worked, what a balance sheet was, or how to hire or manage people. On top of this, she was a slow reader, faced mountains of information to process, and was not on top of news issues. At both The Washington Post and Newsweek, many employees were not comfortable with having a woman at the helm. Her management style, of advice-seeking rather than giving orders, was quite different from the standard male manager's behavior of the time. Let's continue our dive into Graham's autobiography, Personal History. We'll learn how tragedy, both personal and national, shaped and strengthened Catherine Graham as she grew into her new leadership role. We'll also discuss the role Graham and The Post played in the Watergate scandal. Only three months after the devastation of Phil's death came the Kennedy assassination. Graham had a gift for always being at the center of things, and on the day it happened, she was meeting with Kennedy advisors. She describes the shock and confusion of events, including going to the hospital where JFK was being operated on. Graham befriended Kennedy's successor, Lyndon Baines Johnson. She recalls impromptu flights on Air Force One and staying at the Johnson's Texas ranch. Despite Catherine's leanings towards the Democrats, it hurt LBJ that the Washington Post did not explicitly come out for him in the campaign to stay on as president but she was firmly sticking to the Post policy of not endorsing political candidates. After a while, Graham was surprised how much she began to enjoy, even love the job. She took many trips around the world, meeting heads of state, including the Emperor of Japan, and visited other newspapers. After being advised that the Post was getting a bit tired, she poached Ben Bradley from the Washington Bureau of Newsweek. Under Bradley, the editorial budget more than tripled and the paper hired some great writers and journalistic names, 
Even after heading the post for several years, Graham recalls she still felt like a pretender to the throne. In the 1960s, most people, including women, still believed that men were just better at running things and doing important jobs. As a result, women of her generation were unaccustomed to speaking up or making a strong argument. They had a tendency to apologize for everything and to want to please. There were no women at the post in managerial or professional posts, and this was absolutely typical of the times. In no way did Graham feel like a champion of women. She believed her insecurities were the result of her own performance, not society's prejudices. For a long time, she was the only woman at every meeting and either was annoyed at being ignored or terrified of being signaled out. Yet things slowly changed. Graham became friends with feminist leader Gloria Steinem, and with the help of Ben Bradley, she worked to ensure that subtle language reinforcing gender bias was taken out of news stories, that women were hired on merit, and that women reporters did not just get the soft stories. There was a custom in Washington society that after dinners, the men would stay at the table and discuss politics or business, and the wives would go into another room and gossip about children and homes. On one occasion, Graham refused to go along with this. Given her high profile, the effect was that the practice began to peter out. Because she was seen as a conservative on women's issues, the gesture had all the more impact. Here's Graham being interviewed for C-SPAN's book notes. I don't know that I saw myself the way people would view that situation now in which you really were brought up to think that men were intellectually superior um, and that you kind of lived intellectually off them, which is, of course, ridiculous. Even you can work or not work these days. Women have choices. That's the main point. But you have to have your own identity and your own interests. After 10 years at the helm of the Washington Post, Graham still considered herself ignorant of financial discipline, even though she had to speak to Wall Street analysts. But not long after the Post went public in 1971, she describes the great good fortune of investor Warren Buffett buying into the company. Buffett believed the Post's stock to be dramatically undervalued. He admired its high standards and was attracted by its sense of purpose. There was another connection— while a schoolboy in Washington, D.C. in the 1940s, when his father served as a congressman, Buffett had been a delivery boy for the Post. Buffett was a relatively unknown investor at the time, and Graham's advisors cautioned against his taking such a big stake in the company. They were afraid of a takeover, but Graham asked around and established that Buffett was of good character. It was the beginning of a great friendship as well as a business partnership. Buffett gave Catherine an intense, private business education, and she in turn had a big effect on Buffett in terms of the social world that opened up to him. He attended grand dinners at Graham's house and met many famous figures whose friendship Graham took for granted. She claims credit for improving his eating habits, shifting him from burgers and cherry cokes to lobster and making his clothing a little less drab. On starting as editor-in-chief at The Post, Ben Bradley's aim was for the newspaper to be spoken of in the same breath as The New York Times. When The Post published the Pentagon Papers, which detailed the U.S. government's rationale for waging war in Vietnam, it seemed to achieve this. But the expose brought huge backlash. It enraged President Nixon, and a court case was brought against The Post on the basis of it undermining national security. The Post was able to argue, successfully in the end, that publicizing the contents of the papers was not a threat to national security, but in the national interest. The episode further increased Graham's national profile and prepared The Post for an even bigger test of its journalistic resolve, Watergate. The scandal began with a break-in at the Democratic Party's national headquarters in the Watergate building in Washington, D.C., as it seemed like a simple theft job, there wasn't a lot of press follow-up. But two young Washington Post reporters, Bob Woodward and Carl Bernstein, smelled a rat. From the start, it was the Post that kept the matter in the public eye, constantly probing and finding more information about the Republican Party's involvement in the break-in. For their part, the Nixon administration orchestrated a campaign saying that the Post was in league with George McGovern, the Democrat running against Nixon. 
As publisher, Graham was feeling isolated and under attack from the Post's own readers, who accused it of being unpatriotic or the purveyor of bad journalism. She sometimes thought, if this is such a hell of a story, then where is everybody else? Meaning coverage from other newspapers. Despite the Watergate incident, Nixon beat McGovern in a landslide. Nixon now seemed to have a personal vendetta to destroy the Post. Under extreme pressure, Graham stuck by her journalists. Here is Graham on book notes once again. Well, I made a lot of speeches defending us during Watergate. I guess that's when I started really speaking the most. I was trying to explain that we were reporting a story and that we weren't after the administration and that we weren't, it wasn't our intention to do them in, that we were following the footsteps of the story. And so I started speaking quite a lot that year, 72, 70, well, probably later, 73 and 4. In the end, the White House audio tapes revealed Nixon had personally ordered the break-in at Democratic National Headquarters. The Washington Post was vindicated. After suffering the onslaughts of the Nixon administration for two years, it came as a relief to Graham when Gerald Ford was made president. The Post had always carried job listings, and T-shirts now appeared with Ford's face, saying, I got my job through the Washington Post. The Post was now a major national newspaper, famous around the world, and Graham was its figurehead. Yet she admits that she still hated it when she was referred to as powerful. Let's take one more break. Next time, we'll conclude our book insight into Catherine Graham's autobiography, Personal History. We'll discuss the nitty-gritty of Graham's last years as publisher. We'll look into the current state of the Washington Post and consider the legacy of personal history and Graham herself. Enjoying this episode of Book Insights? If so, keep listening and learning. There's a collection of over 100 titles you can read or listen to now at memodapp.com slash insights. That's M-E-M-O-D-A-P-P dot com slash insights. Catherine Graham's image was that of a cultured society hostess who held court from a grand Washington residence. She was the friend of U.S. presidents and their wives and confidant of many key people of the 20th century, including investor Warren Buffett. This image, however, omits the less fabulous details of her life and the decades of hard work to make her family's newspaper, The Washington Post, into the institution it became. Personal history is Graham's autobiography and the story of her journey as the publisher of The Post. Last time in this book, Insight, we discussed Graham's role in the Watergate scandal, publishing stories that made her powerful enemies and standing up for her journalists at all cost. This time, we're concluding our dive into personal history. We'll trace Graham's years after Watergate, learn about the current state of the Washington Post, and wrap up with a consideration of her legacy. Even while the excitement of Watergate and other big news stories were whirling around her, Graham still had to focus on her nuts and bolts daily role of getting a newspaper out to its subscribers and newsstands. Here is Graham speaking on C-SPAN's book notes. Rapidly, we went through the Pentagon Papers and Watergate. And just as I thought things had calmed down, we went through a very violent pressman strike in 75. So those, those were three really cosmic events and that happened. And, and in public, so to speak. She describes the constant pressure of getting the paper to the presses every night and the deep problems with labor unions through the 1970s. The unions encouraged overpaid print room workers to do slowdowns and wage guerrilla warfare with the management and resisted any advances in technology that reduced labor's role. Executives and non-union editors were trained to produce a paper in the event of a strike, but the unions kept their stranglehold. During strikes, Graham personally wrote news stories and became adept at taking classified ads. One caller, a car dealer, told the lady on the other end of the line that he thought she was overqualified. You could be anyone, he said. You could be Catherine Graham. In 1975 came a strike that would last for months. Graham thought the paper would fold, 
employees were being beaten up and shot at by union workers, and advertisers had started leaving the Post for rival newspapers. But the Post worked out a system of getting the paper printed at the presses of suburban newspapers, and in the event, only missed one day of publication. The paper was finally able to sign an agreement with the workers which allowed for redundancies and technological modernization. In 1979, Graham gave over her publisher role to son, Don Graham. It was hard to give up the position, she remembers, but she still had the role of president to focus on the long-term health of the Washington Post Company. And healthy it was. In 1981, the Washington Star, owned by Time Incorporated, ceased operating. It meant that the Post had a virtual monopoly of the city's newspaper market. The rest of the 1980s were good for the company. The Post itself was doing well, and there were successful investments in cell phone networks and cable television. The company was in the Fortune 500. Warren Buffett had increased the value of his initial $10 million investment in the Post to $100 million, and in some years the company was valued at up to $2 billion. Apart from the financial success of the Washington Post Company, Graham herself would receive the Fortune Business Hall of Fame Award and many other accolades and awards. Personal history is ultimately about human potential. Graham felt woefully unprepared for the role she found herself in, yet still ultimately triumphed. This suggests we can all overcome perceived limitations. If you've ever been thrust into a new job or role that seems too much, think of Katherine Graham. She felt she had to perform perfectly and that she made too many mistakes. Only looking back did she see this was normal. If she could succeed in such a situation with all her insecurities and lack of experience, the message of the book is that we all can. Although initially the reluctant feminist, Graham gave hope and inspiration to millions of women entering corporate life. Though her lack of ego seemed to be an obstacle to success in a thrusting, male-dominated business world, in hindsight, it proved to be a plus. Graham was able to fully give herself to the post, often at considerable cost to her time and privacy. Seen from the perspective of today's polarized political environment, Graham's openness to all points of view and her deep friendships on both sides of politics now seems unusual and commendable. Remarkably, she managed to remain on good terms with her friend Henry Kissinger during the Nixon years while he was Secretary of State, and he provides a preface to the book. As well as her friendship with the Kennedys and Johnsons, she became the unlikely pal of the Reagans after Ronald became president. In 2013, Amazon's Jeff Bezos paid $250 million of his own money to acquire the Washington Post Company. It seemed a curious acquisition for an Internet billionaire, particularly at a time when traditional newspapers had lost so much ground to online sources of news and analysis. But Bezos seemed to see the same thing that Warren Buffett had done, that the Post was not just another newspaper, but an institution. After eight decades in the Graham family, Don Graham and Lally Weymouth, Catherine's daughter and an esteemed journalist, accepted the Bezos offer because they felt he had a long-term view, was willing to keep investing in the company, and seemed to share Eugene Meyer's original vision that dogged pursuit of truth was both rare and valuable. What is the ultimate message of Catherine Graham's life and her book? The paradox is that pursuing the truth is not just the right thing to do, but can be very profitable. After all, a business exists to provide a service or product that people need, and we all need to know the truth about our politicians and the way we are being governed. As Phil Graham once famously said, journalism is the first rough draft of history. Along with Woodward, Bernstein, and Benjamin Bradley, Catherine Graham reminded the world that journalism could be a noble calling. The truth matters. Then. Now. Always. Thank you for listening to Book Insights. Check out the rest of our content at memodap.com. Please keep in mind that the information provided in or through our Book Insights episodes is for educational and informational purposes only. It's not intended to be a substitute for advice given by qualified professionals and should not be relied upon to disregard or delay seeking professional advice.
Thank you.